All right, well, it's 630. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third night of the 2020 Women in Clean Energy Conference. We are so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for joining. This is our second year of hosting an all virtual conference, but I think that it has really helped us open opportunities for our audience and invite speakers from across the country. My name is Andrea Zalcourt and I will be moderating tonight's session. I'm a senior at the University of Dayton studying mechanical engineering with a concentration in energy systems and will graduate this May. I've had the pleasure of working with an amazing team of women to help plan this conference for you. And we hope that you find value in the topics and resources that we have planned for you. During tonight's session, women with great experience in their field will speak about the social impact of clean energy and how they are working to make the clean energy revolution beneficial for everyone. We invite all attendees to submit questions through the Q&A feature during the session and questions will be addressed after our final presenter. I would also like to let you know that today's session will be recorded and the recording will be posted on our website. Our first speaker tonight is Diana Hernandez, tenured associate professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia University. Her topics of research are energy, equity, housing, and health. Her work focuses on social and environmental factors that impact policy and place based interventions for the health and well being of socioeconomically disadvantaged populations. Dr. Hernandez has also conducted foundational research on the concept of energy insecurity in which she has explored the multiple dimensions that surround energy injustice. Hello, everyone. Uh, I guess I'm uh, no longer muted. I'm happy to be here, excited for the invitation um, and really um, very grateful for the opportunity to talk about um, women in energy um, and uh, be alongside such an esteemed group of, um, of panelists. Uh, I wanna share my screen um, and I will do that now. Uh, basically um, my intention for today is to uh, talk a little bit about um, energy, health, and justice, and think about the kind of critical intersection that is um, uh, that are these kind of three issues, um, especially in the context of climate change. Uh, I always kind of like to situate this work uh, in thinking about the centrality of energy um, in our daily lives. Um, we can't be all that we're intended uh, to be uh, and self-actualize. Um, but for uh, the ability to um, use energy on a, on a daily basis. And, and that's uh, for the kind of um, simple things like uh, charging our cell phones um, or lighting or refrigeration, but also cooling, uh, refrigeration, um, heating, um, and the like. And really, uh, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it really kind of is such a base issue uh, without, uh, you know, kind of the ability to um, meet those needs, it's really hard, um, again, to kind of achieve uh, all that we can. And, and we see this every day uh, in the United States and around the world. In fact, the World Health Organization uh, recognizes that energy is essential to meeting our basic needs, that of cooking, boiling water, lighting, and heating. It's also a prerequisite for good health, they say. Um, and, uh, you know, they also kind of acknowledged um, back... Uh, 15 years ago um, that energy was uh, kind of ignored um, by the world community in part because it's an invisible good. Um, it's the kind of thing that um, we uh, experience uh, but that we don't give uh, too much um, mind to uh, except for when we suddenly don't have access to it. And I always like to kind of think about the human side of energy. There are so many technical ways in which we can situate uh, the, the kind of potentials and problems of, of energy. But um, at the intersection of uh, like the human experience, uh, it can actually not only give life, but it can take life. 
Um, and so um, this is the example of Linda Daniels, who a few years ago um, was living on an oxygen concentrator. Um, and uh, there was a, a kind of a temperature-based um, shutoff protection in New Jersey where she lived, um, where if the uh, temperatures exceeded 95 degrees, uh, she would be spared um, a shutoff. But because it was 90 degrees that day, um, and it was early in the morning. Uh, she had a non-payment situation that her family and her uh, medical providers were trying to uh, uh, rectify. Uh, and she got caught in the kind of bureaucratic, um, you know, kind of mess uh, that can be uh, utility bills. Um, and they shut her off. And uh, within a few hours, she had passed away. And the New York Times basically said that this was totally preventable. But the fact is that people are dying um, on a regular basis. Um, and one life is too many to lose uh, to something as um, kind of uh, inhumane as a shut off. Uh, so this basically um, uh, kind of leads to this broader concept of energy insecurity, which I've defined as the inability to adequately meet basic household energy needs. It's multidimensional um, in the sense that it's not just based on uh, a low income, although low income people are much more likely to experience energy insecurity and have trouble affording their utility bills. It also has uh, to do with the physical dimensions of housing and, uh, you know, how you know efficient uh, the home environment is. Um, you know how needy of uh, kind of more thermal conditioning, for instance, the home environment um, is rendered essentially um, whether or not there are um, adequate um, and modern um, access uh, and access to modern energy infrastructure um, in the homes. And then also the idea that people don't take these issues lightly and uh, many actually do things um, to address uh, economic and physical hardships. Um, and they're coping um, by turning on their ovens for uh, heat or sometimes uh, you know, kind of keeping their homes uh, at an unhealthy temperature or trading off between other essentials like medicine and food. Uh, in fact, um, it's these same kind of definitions that the, um, uh, the Energy Information Administration um, has used um, in their kind of uh, assessment of energy insecurity at the national level and 37 million households in the United States uh, are energy insecure, one in three households. So um, your neighbor to your left and your uh, right, one of you is likely to be energy insecure depending on, of course, where you live. Um, and for some people, this is a, a problem that happens all of the time uh, and that you would see in the dark blue bars. Uh, and for some households, it's actually something that happens conditionally. So that might be driven by seasons or fluctuations in earnings, um, et cetera. But one thing that is really clear is that energy insecurity is patterned by some of the same uh, social vulnerabilities that we are all too familiar with. So low income households are much more likely to be energy insecure. Ch households with children, um, uh, people living in older homes, African Americans and Latinx populations are much more likely to experience energy insecurity than our other groups. Um, and uh, that kind of leads us to not just thinking about this as a kind of a human centered problem, but also as one that has sociological relevance. Um, and so I um, kind of position the problem of energy insecurity kind of further upstream in terms of the kind of uh, racialized uh, dynamics uh, that create the pathways um, for uh, kind of poor health um, and disadvantage kind of cyclical patterns of poverty, for instance, um, so that, you know, in the context of, um, you know, redline communities, et cetera, uh, you know, places that are marked by low social cohesion um, and dilapidated buildings in a concentrated fashion. Uh, you know, you have this kind of manifestation of economic, physical and coping uh, dimensions of energy insecurity that lead to um, environmental, adverse environmental health and um, social consequences. Uh, and uh, so some of that looks like excess mold and moisture in homes, which we know has implications for respiratory health, also thermal discomfort, 
and extreme home temperatures, the risk of death um, as a result of that. Um, then there are also the kind of adverse health consequences, which um, you know, are absolutely about poor sleep quality, but they're also about poor mental health um, and just the cumulative burden um, associated with these hardships. Just if you look kind of upstream and how this is kind of configured, dealing with any one of these things would be difficult. Dealing with all of them together, of course, is extremely burdensome. And then there are the kind of social consequences, um, you know, parents uh, facing challenges with the uh, child protective services and feeling like if they're, you know, living through a shutoff, uh, that they are at risk of losing uh, custody of their children, um, the disruption of family life as the result of even a power outage, for instance, school absenteeism, and also the shame and stigma associated with a phenomenon like energy insecurity. We've gone on to kind of think through the different pieces of this, recognizing that for some households, as indicated by the um, uh, EIA data that I just shared, um, you know, this is a chronic problem. They're chronically, uh, you know, managing or trying their best to manage unaffordable energy bills. But for some people, it's also an acute problem, and that acuteness comes from a disruption, like a complete disconnection as a result of non-payment uh, or a power outage. Uh, or something else that impedes their energy access. And, you know, through this kind of complexity of mediators and primary and se secondary impacts, you have the impacts on, on health, the long-term impacts on health. And this is kind of a little bit of a laundry list of uh, the different uh, outcomes uh, that are associated with, that are known to be associated with um, energy insecurity. And of course, climate change kind of adds a, a whole different dimension um, and, and, as, and acts as a structural and, and external kind of pressure point uh, that makes uh, some of these challenges um, even that much more real. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through uh, some of the um, some of what's known in terms of the energy and health nexus um, and then uh, seed my time. So uh, we know that energy assistance reduces food insecurity. So people that have access to the low income home energy assistance program are much more likely uh, to have a healthy weight and to meet developmental milestones. Uh, they're also less likely to have acute um, hospitalization visits. Um, I also um, have found in, in my own work that food subsidies reduce energy insecurity so that households that both have uh, the um, access to the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, aka food stamps, um, and, uh, the, and WIC, so Women, Infant, and Children uh, Nutritional Supplements, uh, are combined are much more likely to be energy secure. We also know that there's, you know, in this study, we found that one, so uh, one in two households were both energy and food um, insecure, um, and that bundling of hardship can also come in the form of housing insecurity. Um, we've also found that energy insecurity in its moderate and severe forms uh, are associated with asthma, with pneumonia, uh, with depressive disorder uh, as diagnosed by a physician, but also self-reported anxiety and depression as well as poor sleep quality. And we feel pretty confident of these results because they're not, it's not associated with chronic illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, and an accidental fall, although energy insecurity can exacerbate those conditions. So if you don't have a refrigeration for your insulin, for instance, um, it can complicate uh, your diabetes uh, management, or if you're living with a lot of stress, obviously that can also kind of have implications for hypertension. Fires um, are, uh, and, and the fatalities associated with household fires have a lot to do with aged um, electricity uh, in homes. Uh, another piece to this is, uh, and I've kind of been mentioning this in terms of thinking about the cumulative burden, is just how hard it is for people to live um, in those uh, circumstances. Arlene Geronimus, who's a, a professor at uh, University of Michigan, uh, came up with this idea, the weathering hypothesis, essentially that, you know, kind of with enough stressors, uh, our bodies start to change and there's a psychosocial biological response to all of these stressors that ultimately kind of create 
opportunities for chronic disease to form in um, in our bodies, and that this is kind of this weathering process is disproportionately um, evidenced in um, in African American uh, women in particular. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of research kind of substantiating uh, the uh, kind of links between psychosocial stress uh, and a biological response. Um, and you know, some of our work has also looked at uh, interventions and the opportunity for disrupting the pathway that leads to weathering. Uh, and of, of course, addressing poor housing conditions and um, energy insecurity by way of weatherization is one example uh, of intervening um, uh, in those conditions. The other piece of this, um, you know, is we kind of imagine a different world, one that is decarbonized and clean and far less polluted. We also realize that there are some populations that are truly left behind. Um, and that is absolutely true um, in the transition to clean heat, for instance, um, and also clean cooking uh, options. And these are both depicted on the left. What we do know certainly about the clean um, clean heat trends um, that that the phasing out of, of of basically dirty fuels for heating purposes is that it wasn't evenly distributed in the city um, in New York City where uh, we did this work um, kind of evaluating uh, the uh, impact of clean heat policies uh, both on air quality but also on its distributional um, components we found that communities of color and low-income communities, communities that were already marked by health disparities and environmental burdens were the least likely to adopt clean, um, clean energy uh, for heating purposes um, and also um, are, are just more, much more likely uh, to still um, live under those circumstances and not have coupled it with energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and as we kind of think about, um, you know, moving to, uh, electric electric based cooking uh the same thing is true and and we forget of, often that um you know uh these uh natural gas based cooking um uh, appliances are also used to supplement heat um so when a landlord for instance isn't uh kind of providing enough heat uh, some people are turning on uh, their ovens or stovetops uh, and therefore not just um, kind of providing uh, a, a, a supplemental uh, form of heating, but also um, introducing uh, toxic exposures um, into their home environments. And I'd like to end with the idea that energy is an enabler of social connections. Um, and when your home isn't thermally comfortable or you're unable to kind of turn on the lights because you're living through a shut off um, or that you're very preoccupied with the cost of energy, that you're probably more likely to do live in that, um, uh, live, live under those circumstances, um, you know, kind of without making it a private, a, a public affair. I always think of energy insecurity as, uh, you know, kind of the ultimate form of private suffering. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, there are many health epidemics that we deal with, but one is certainly loneliness and social isolation. And many of us have actually kind of personally experienced this through the pandemic. Uh, but this is also something that is especially acute for the elderly and for other people for whom, you know, energy is such a hardship. Um, and rather than inviting people over, for instance, they kind of manage those circumstances alone and sometimes they also die under those circumstances also alone. And that reminds me a lot of Eric Kleinenberg's work around the heat wave uh, in which he showed that he had showed uh, those results. And so I'm gonna stop there. Um, obviously, you know, a big part of my work has been uh, to kind of make, uh, to, to offer a framework uh, for understanding the kind of social and uh, health uh, component uh, of, of energy um, and also to humanize uh, the experience. Um, and, you know, as someone who's a social scientist coming into the world uh, of energy, I appreciate uh, the technology, but also know that people are interfacing with that technology in such a way uh, that does represent significant hardships. And in the context of not really thinking about a rights-based approach to energy, we have, um, you know, kind of a, a ways to go in terms of how 
uh, you know, we approach this issue more equitably. So thank you for your time. And I look forward to questions later on. Thank you so much, Diana. What a great start to today's session. Next, I would like to introduce our second speaker of the night, Aaron Pfeiffer, expert fellow with Engineering for Change. Aaron is a UD alumna and currently manages several fellows who are working on research projects, ranging from benchmarking wave power desalination technologies to mapping engineering for good career paths. Her other experience includes immersions in South Africa and Ghana, where she worked with biomass power and heating technology. Thank you so much. And what a pleasure to be here today on such a great panel. Um, thank you, Dr. Hernandez, for, for starting us off. And I think there's so many parallels between what you presented and what, what I'm planning on talking today. So I'm really excited to get into it. Um, so I'll be talking today about uh, global access to clean energy. Once I figure out how to navigate Yes, global access to clean energy. Um, so uh, for my presentation today, I was going to speak to some of my experiences over the last several years with global clean energy and thought it might be a good uh, and helpful place to start with a little bit of background on myself and how I was introduced to clean energy, uh, especially since it all started here at UD. Um, so I graduated from UD in 2017 with a degree in mechanical engineering and early at my time at UD, I became interested in human rights and social initiatives and social justice, and then discovered the engineering department's ethos center, which kind of checked all those boxes. Um, and so I participated in my first summer immersion with Ethos in 2016, working in Durban, South Africa with an improved cook stoves company. And this was my first exposure to the world of improved cook stoves and clean energy initiatives. And I was a bit hooked. Um, and I stuck around at UD for my master's in renewable and clean energy, conducting research on sustainable aviation fuels in the heat lab and participated in my second Ethos immersion in Ghana, working on the design of improved Shea Nut Roaster, which I will be speaking to more in a little bit. Um, after leaving UD, I went out to Oregon State University, continuing my clean household energy research on the adoption and social impacts of improved cook stoves. And while there, I interned with International Lifeline Fund, which is a nonprofit NGO that supports clean water and clean energy initiatives in several countries. Um, and I was able to work with them to carry out a field study in Uganda, which I will also speak to in more depth in a bit. Uh, now I'm a research manager with Engineering for Change, a nonprofit under ASME uh, that is a community and network of experts that are working to prepare engineers worldwide to use their skills to improve the quality of life for communities that are underserved, with a focus on eight different key sectors, one of which is uh, energy. I apologize, my keyboard is sometimes laggy. Um, so a little bit of background on uh, global access to clean energy. Uh, currently 759 million people around 10% of the global population don't have access to electricity with 660 million projected to still not have access to electricity in 2030. And um, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I hadn't heard the one in three in the US are energy insecure. And so obviously these statistics here don't capture that. They don't capture the reality, the lived experience of many. So the US electrification rate is 100%, but then knowing that 30, that 33% of, of the population is still energy insecure kind of, I think, casts a new light on these statistics. Um, but uh, something that might also be shocking is that due to the cost of electricity, uh, unstable grids, or a combination of other factors, um, 2.6 billion, around a third of the world's population, doesn't have access to clean cooking. And when I talk about clean cooking, I'm referring to cooking devices and fuels that result in emissions below the WHO guidelines. Um, so cooking that typically doesn't meet those guidelines are ones that use biomass. So that's things like wood or charcoal, straw, dung, uh, things like that, kerosene, coal, um, except when those fuels are used in combination with a very, very high performing uh, cook stove. Um, clean cooking, on the other hand, would include things such as using electricity or solar LPG stoves um, and such. 
And then another term that I'm I'll use going forward is improved cook stoves, which are stoves that may not meet the WHO guidelines for emissions, but are improvements from traditional cook stoves, which vary based on context, but may look like a three stone fire or a locally mudded stove, um, both of which offer kind of poor performance in terms of uh, combustion and thermal efficiencies. Um, in 2019, it was estimated that 2.3 million uh, people died as a result of indoor air pollution, largely caused from the use of non-clean cook stove use. And what we know is that these deaths and other burdens associated with the use of non-clean household energy sources disproportionately falls on women and children because they're in the one they are the ones in the home and they're the ones that are exposed to the smoke. Um, and burdens of indoor air pollution and other negative attributes of traditional cooking practices um, using biomass, um, again, uh, disproportionately affect women. And this is obviously a major problem. So how do we scale uh, clean energy access? Oops. Sorry, my keyboard again is making me uh, want to write. Oh no, maybe one of the moderators can help out. It's not letting me unclick from the laser pointers. Thank you. Oop. I'm at the end. <laughs> Here, I can, I can relinquish control and then re-grant access. Okay, that'd be great, thanks. Are you able to now? Otherwise I can just click through for you. Okay, no, I think I should be good from now on. Thanks. Okay, okay so uh, one slide back, but I think I should have access. Nope, I might have to have you click through for me. Thank you. Um, so uh, scaling uh, clean energy access at a 10,000 foot view, um, like with most things requires political commitment and financial support through some sort of coordinated effort. Um, but what my research looked at uh, was at scale or adoption at the individual or community level. Um, historically, there have been challenges with uh, targeted communities adopting improved or clean household energy technologies, which comes down to a few different factors, including design, community characteristics, and market regulations and policies. Um, and engineers like to pay particular attention to the design piece, uh, which includes things like technical performance, affordability, usability of the technology, uh, with particular interest given to the technical performance piece, which is sometimes at the expense of usability and affordability, which plays into the challenges with adoption. Um, community characteristics includes things like demographics, cultural norms, values, gender norms, which also influence the design of the technology, but also how the technology is marketed. Um, and then lastly, when we look at market regulations and policies, these can include things like offering user training or subsidies to make the technologies more affordable or supply chains, for example. And all these factors are important in considerations when we're thinking about adoption and scale. Uh, next slide. With that background information, I wanted to talk specifically about a few of the projects that I was involved with that illustrate some of these points. Um, the first project I wanna talk about is the Improved Sh Chain Up Roaster project for my Ethos Immersion in 2018. So Chain Up Roasting is just one of a very long and tedious process to get shea butter. And I'm showing here all the steps that are involved with the secondary processing of shea nuts. What I'm not showing here is all the primary processing that starts with the shea fruit and ends with the shea nut. Um, the secondary processing includes sorting, washing, drying, crushing, roasting, milling, kneading, separating the butter, boiling to purify, and lastly, cooling and packaging the butter. 
Um, and all of these processes are very labor intensive. And so during my internship, I was working with the company Burrow and Burn Design Labs on designing an improved shade nut roaster specifically so that uh, orange highlighted uh, cell. Uh, the picture you see on the left is how shea uh, is traditionally roasted in a large pot over a three stone fire. And what you see on the right are improved shea nut roasters that some people had. Um, but you can see with both that the fuel is resting directly on the ground, which significantly reduces the combustion and thermal efficiencies. And although the one on the right does have some shielding to conserve heat, um, both of them are, are uh, far from ideal. Um, since I came in at the early stages of the project, a lot of what we did was visiting Shea Nut Roasters and talking with them about their concerns and what they wanted to see in an improved design, so taking a human-centered design approach. Um, for both of these roasting methods, women, and I say women specifically because they are the ones that do the processing, um, they discuss serious issues with being exposed to heat, suffering from burns, breathing in smoke, resulting in chest pains, having teary eyes. And at one of the places uh, that we visited, they were using plastic to start their fire since the wood was wet, which we know is carcinogenic. Um, and additionally, it wasn't uncommon for women to have their children or babies with them while they worked. So they're also being exposed to all of this. Um, say the project is ongoing with field testing of the latest prototype, trying to assess the technical performance, usability and affordability factors. Um, and while the processing of shea butter for profit touches on much larger issues around labor and capital, it also highlights some of the real impacts that women and children face as a result of not having consistent and affordable access to clean energy. Um, I also included the whole shea butter process here as well, because I wanted to note that in more urban areas where shea butter is processed, we saw that the two hardest parts of the job, namely the crushing and milling of the nuts, was mechanized because they are truly awful and really labor intensive uh, pieces of that uh, process. But the mechanization of this task means that oftentimes men now own these machines and women have to pay them to use them, which I highlight because I think it's an important piece on both the positive and negative impacts of technology and cl clean energy and how those impacts aren't always equitably distributed. Uh, next slide. So more recently, in the beginning of this year, I worked with International Lifeline Funds on carrying out a field study assessing the factors influencing adoption and improved cook stoves um, and the perceived social impacts experienced uh, since households adopted these improved cook stoves. Uh, due to COVID, I assisted with the field study entirely remotely, and I'm very grateful to the Lifeline team for their support in executing the study. Um, we collected data in peri-urban and rural communities, and we used a social impact framework that included 11 social impact categories that we explored through the field study using a card sorting methodology. So basically we asked households that had adopted improved cook stoves to sort cards with each one of the social impacts on them into one of three cups, uh, most impacted, somewhat impacted and least impacted. And then we facilitated conversations around uh, each one of the cards after they were placed to get a better understanding of why they made that decision. And what we found from this activity was that households experienced largely positive benefits since acquiring their improved cook stoves. Um, they expressed fewer instances of in illness and injury related to cooking, um, fewer fights. And this is a big one since many women described how before if dinner was late, their husbands would be angry. Um, but now that the food can be prepared more quickly, they fight much less. Um, they talked about how their children made it to school on time since their breakfast can be made so quickly, whereas before there was more absenteeism. Um, since the stove design makes it much easier to use, uh, many expressed how their sons and husbands are now more likely to help with the cooking tests. Um, Additionally, since the stove design allows for the fire to continue going without constant attention, they're able to set their stove and go to work uh, and make more money or to attend community meetings without worrying about the fire going out or their children being hurt uh, by the stove. Um, one negative impact that was mentioned, though, uh, is that most households now had fewer nighttime gatherings, which was a tradition. They would have their open fire, which provided light and heat, and they'd have family and friends come over every night, and they would sit around the fire. Um, but a lot, 
of people mentioned that this has been reduced since their improved cook stove no longer provides those benefits. Um, next slide. So to wrap up, I present some very high level takeaways and some of my lessons learned for these projects and others. Uh, first and most importantly, everyone deserves to have access to clean energy. As illustrated here, we know that lack of access disproportionately affects women and children. And I touched on how the impacts, both positive and negative of technology adoption should be considered, knowing that we live in a world where the existing systems often don't lend themselves to equitable outcomes for all. Um, the last two points I included here, although I didn't explicitly highlight them in the prior slides because I think they are important to include, um, with clean energy technologies for households, there is a tendency to place the burden of technology adoption on the end users for the intended benefit of society at large. And what I mean like that, by that, for example, biomass burning we know contributes somewhat significantly to black carbon creation. Um, in the atmosphere. And sometimes this is used as a motivation for pushing adoption of cleaner improved cook stoves on communities, but this burden isn't and shouldn't be theirs to hold. And so thinking through those motivations um, when designing technologies and then the narratives that we tell about them uh, is important. And on a related note, as engineers, I think it's very easy to get lost in the endless potential of technology, but I think it is important that technology on its own can't address disparities, it, but it is one piece in the puzzle. Um, so to keep that in mind. Um, and with that, uh, I look forward to answering questions uh, after the session, please feel free to use the chat. And thank you for uh, sharing the slides for me, Angelica. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Another great presentation. I would now like to introduce our third speaker, Anya Gully Robertson, Assistant Prof Professor of Sociology at the University of Dayton. Dr. Gully Robertson studies environmental politics, energy policy, and social movements, with a particular emphasis on policy debates, framing, and social movement tactics. Her current research explores counterframing and debates over clean energy in Ohio through context analysis and interviews with policy actors. Hi, everyone. Um, I think I need, great, I've got control of the screen. Um, and apologies for my bad lighting. I have a new baby, so I'm actually sitting on my um, bedroom closet floor for this presentation. Um, but I'm really happy to be here today, and I am really happy to be following um, these two presentations because um, what I'm going to be talking about today is not actually um, related to the research that I'm doing. If folks have questions about that, um, I am happy to answer them in the Q&A. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about the role of women in transforming energy systems toward energy justice. Um, and so I actually want to start with um, a, you know what, Angelica, it does not look like it control your screen. Oh, there we go. It's, there's just a delay. Yeah, okay. Um, so I just want to start with um, an experience that I had my first year at the University of Dayton. Um, I went to a meeting about an energy justice um, project that I was going to be working on um, with some of the engineering students and with Dr. Kevin Hallinan. Um, and I got into the elevator in Kettering Labs, um, which many of you are familiar with. Um, and I was in there alone and an older man walked in and he stands next to me and a few other students walk in and a couple other male graduate students walk in. And it turns out that the older man is a professor and he knows the graduate students. And they start to have this conversation and I'm standing in the middle of the elevator. I'm sure all of the women um, in this session have had a similar experience and they're having the conversation through me. It's like I'm not even in that space. Um, and we were, you know, the elevators are slow. I'm standing there and I'm thinking, you know, this is a really good analogy for how it feels a lot of the time to be women in these spaces where the system is simply functioning sort of around us and we're one of the only women in the room. 
Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about to start with is actually just a little bit of data, the data that I could find on how many women are actually working in clean energy fields. And then I'm gonna talk about why women's perspectives are essential to transforming energy systems um, toward a more just and equitable outcome um, and toward outcomes that are better for women in general. So just a quick few pieces of data. All of these are linked in the slides if folks are interested in the sources. Um, we know that if we look at the um, boards of um, large energy companies, um, only 16% of board members at the world's largest two, uh, 200 um, electric utilities are women. So um, at the global level, women are underrepresented in leadership. Um, we also know that women are just a smaller portion of the workforce in the US when it comes to energy related sectors. Um, we make up 47% of the workforce, but um, we only make up 23 to 32% of um, the energy related workforce. We're at the higher end of that when it comes to um, clean energy sectors like wind and solar. Um, but again, this is not um, fully representative. Um, then when we look at sort of younger people, we see that millennials make up um, about 30% of the utility workforce and 40% of engineering and line worker positions. Um, but the percentage of women um, is still low. So um, again, we're just underrepresented and there are all sorts of reasons for this, um, of course. But it's important to kind of start with like, where are we in terms of these sectors? Um, here's another one. Um, lower than 20%. So you'll see that some of these numbers are varying. That's because we actually don't have great um, data on some of these things. Um, but the, you know, the thing we wanna think about here is not just in the US, but also at a global level, um, how we could look at this. So here's another um, way of measuring this and um, ey.com actually, which is linked at the bottom of here, has some really, really great resources for women. Um, looking to get into energy fields. Um, so I recommend visiting that if you're interested in any of these links. So the bigger question here is really why women are underrepresented in energy fields. Um, and from a sociological perspective, there are some different things that we know um, about um, how gender roles and gender norms sort of play out. And it looks like my font ended up really small here for some reason, I apologize for that. Um, but one of the things, and this has to, a lot to do with um, what the two other speakers in this session talked about was that traditionally women had been seen as energy users um, and men have been seen as the producers and decision makers. Um, and so when we think about that, we think about the design often happening um, outside the scheme of women's influence, whereas women are seen as just using these products. And so what we need is more women on that decision-making um, side. The other thing you know, that we know is that masculinity tends to be associated with more technical fields of work um, and that as women are coming into STEM um, fields at higher levels um, and at higher numbers, we're seeing some transformation there. So we're moving away from that, but that is still, you know, when we get to the top levels of these organizations, we still see situations that are, you know, reproductions of my situation in that elevator. Um, in some ways. And then finally, we know that male dominated um, workplaces and workforces tend to be more unwelcoming to women. So, um, you know, some of this is just about getting more women in the door, but I'm also going to argue that we need to do more than just that. Um, we also know that gendered occupations matter here um, simply in that, um, you know, a lot of the more physical jobs that are associated with energy work tend to go um, more toward men. Um, and so this isn't just about women at the higher levels of these um, organizations, but it's also about getting women into some of these really well-paying, um, more technical jobs, um, you know, working in the energy sectors. So, you know, these are important points to make. It's important to know how many women are in these fields. But the fact that we have made it in the door at all levels at this point means that we do need to go farther. Um, and the role that women have to play in clean energy and energy justice is something that's being discussed um, more and more as women gain more status just in terms of pure numbers in these fields. And what I wanna to touch on now is a paper that was just published in 2020. I think this has been shared with the conference attendees in some way. Um, 
which is called Toward Feminist Energy Systems, Why Adding Women and Solar Panels is Not Enough. And the premise of this paper is that, um, you know, our thinking about clean energy, our thinking about energy justice, our thinking about gender and energy has been fairly additive up until this point. We've looked at how can we, you know, add more clean energy to the grid or how can we get more women into the room? Um, but what this paper argues and what a lot of feminist scholars um, in the social sciences who are looking at energy are arguing is really that women have to be at the core of a transformation of the energy system um, in order to achieve many of the goals that we're looking at in terms of energy justice. Um, and so really what this paper is about, um, and you're welcome to read this quote, but it's really not just a recommendation, they say to simply switch out the gender identities of those at the top. Um, it is rather an invitation to imagine and design such systems from an alternative value system. And so these authors make the argument that women's perspectives, and that's what they're talking about um, when they're talking about a feminist approach. So a women-centered and feminist um, theory inspired approach to thinking about energy systems can give us some different perspectives um, and different ways to approach the questions that are really, really the big questions we need to be looking at when we're looking at energy justice. Um, so the challenge here, right, is that we are working still within systems thinking that has been male dominated. These are male dominated fields. Um, you know, women's representation is increasing, but when we're looking historically at this, we're looking at decision making that really has been driven by profit rather than concern for equity or environmental protection when it comes down to the decisions that are made at the highest levels at the biggest utilities, for example. Um, the other thing is that implementation of clean energy um, really has been one that has been additive in terms of bringing more clean energy online, which we've done a great job with, hasn't actually meant less fossil fuel consumption. So what we've seen is that, you know, we've added solar panels, we're adding cleaner forms of energy, we're making energy more efficient, but we aren't necessarily consuming less fossil fuel, we're simply consuming more energy. And so what we need here is a shift in perspective that really says, how can we redesign this to actually move away from um, the forms of energy that are problematic. And women are essential both from the top down and the top bottoms and the, and the bottom up. Um, so in the first place, we can talk about how poor gender diversity at the highest levels can mean that industries are less open to new ideas, um, in particular, um, less open to moving to lower carbon energy systems or less open to prioritizing um, other ends other than profit. Um, the other thing to think about is that commitments to reducing emissions are more common under women's leadership. Um, so we've seen a lot of um, studies about different nations and their um, environmental policies and how more action on environmental issues, especially related to climate change and environmental justice, is associated with higher numbers of women in governmental positions and leadership positions. Um, the other thing to think about is that women, just on average, when we survey women in public opinion surveys, um, are more likely than men to express concern for the environment or have strong pro-climate and pro-environmental opinions and beliefs. So simply having people who are more likely, um, and there's a whole process of socialization that goes into why women might be more likely to be concerned about these things, um, but simply having those people represented within decision-making structures is really important. Um, from the bottom up, this is also important. So when we talk about women being perceived as users of energy rather, at, rather than decision makers about energy, um, that doesn't mean that we should discount how women use energy. In fact, if we were to focus our systems thinking by starting with the users, um, and that's something that um, Erin talked about in her talk, right? Starting with how are these things actually being used on the ground? Um, we need more work that does that essentially, because women are making the majority of household consumption decisions in at a global level. And because of that, um, we're more likely to see behavior change um, if we focus on the decisions that women are making and if we actually talk to women and bring women into the design and um, redesign process. 
The other thing is that women um, just tend to value eco-friendly products and renewable energy um, more highly than men do when we see behavioral research on this. So again, um, we really want to center on women's experiences and perspectives here. So this feminist energy systems paper, which I encourage everyone to read, um, talks about energy systems from four dimensions. And I just want to also point out that when we talk about transforming energy systems, um, we really have to think about them in different dimensions. So, um, you know, it can't just be the technology fix that um, Aaron pointed out. You know, we can get wrapped up in, oh, this is great technology, but we also have to be looking at, um, are we also transforming the context in which that technology is used? Um, are we also, you know, taking into account the socio-ecological landscape um, that is shaping the experiences that people are having um, you know, are we looking at the total context of challenges a household is facing, or are we just looking at the one component that might be energy? So um, looking at this more holistically, um, bringing in perspectives that are driven by economic goals that are not simply about growth and profit, um, and really taking a decentralized and democratic um, approach to the design process, the implementation, um, but also to sort of the rethinking of how our energy systems can work. And so the argument here is really that women should be at the core of a transformation of our energy systems and not just something that we add in um, as we preserve the status quo. So just a couple points before I wrap up, you know, the question here is like, how do we get there, right? It's great to talk about transformation, but how do we actually get to the point where those transformations are possible um, and where women's voices are able to be heard and where women's perspectives are able to be centered in these ways. So the first is just that we really do need to increase the representation of women in technical and leadership position. Um, women's employment in the energy sectors is almost um, most prominent in these mid-level support careers um, and least common in either the skilled trade side or in the leadership and management side. Um, and so at the entry level, we need to boost women's participation um, in STEM programs and increase the attractiveness of the industry as an actual career choice for women. Um, at the mid-level, we really need to look at equity in terms of hiring and um, workplace um, conditions, as well as workforce development. And we also need to look at work-life balance policies that um, equally benefit men and women. Um, as a new mom, I'm especially... Um, <laughs> Uh, interested in those right now. And then at the exec executive le level, um, we need to think about how women are held back um, from those highest level positions and think about ways to transform our organizations so that women have the same opportunities to advance to the highest levels. Um, we also need to challenge assumptions about technology, STEM, and energy careers. So women um, account for less than a third of employees in scientific research and development positions. And those are often a lot of the positions where we see these um, sort of transformational technologies being created. Um, so it's important to think about how to get more women into those areas. And it's also important to think about women outside of STEM fields. So many of you here are engineering or STEM, um, degree women, but we also need you to be talking to your friends in all sorts of other um, careers and majors in order to really diversify um, the ways that women are participating. So we have all of these other ways that we can participate beyond just the STEM field, so it can't just be a conversation about women in STEM. And then finally, we as women need to drive change and transform these systems by staying at the table. So of course the change won't happen if women are not in the room, but it's our role to stay at the table um, and to push for the change that we see as being important um, and to trust that when um, diversity increases, those decision-making structures can increase as well. Um, thank you. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Anya, and thank you to all three speakers for providing firsthand inspirational insight to the work that you are doing, and thank you for your contributions to this field. I would now like to invite all speakers back on video for the Q&A portion of the session this evening. So I'm going to start with a question that is for any of the speakers. Um, 
How can we make sure that communities impacted by energy insecurity have a voice in the process of increasing energy access? I know I'm the most obvious person to answer that question, but I'm curious what the other panelists might say. At least from, from my work and uh, my perspective, I think related to the work that I've done is really getting community involvement and having community involvement before projects even start, defining what projects look like in the beginning coming from the community um, and understanding what their concerns are before you get to the point of submitting proposals for funding, before you get to the point of uh, implementing things and then requesting support or feedback on how things are going, starting uh, at the very beginning with their input to guide all decisions going forward. Um. Yeah, and to follow up on that, I think also, um, you know, taking an approach to community involvement that isn't just picking and choosing the community members or organizations or locations that are easiest to involve, um, I think the challenge um, when we're doing research, especially, is to look at a place where research has been done before. It would be easy to talk to these people or people are willing to participate. And so really um, thinking about how community engagement can start with the community instead of starting with the university. Um, and that really draws on what Erin just said. Um, but I think a lot of that really requires um, a qualitative approach or a community engaged approach that um, connects with the community and then involves them in the research um, from the start and then keeps them on board um, even instead of just consulting and then doing something and then implementing it. Um, you know, citizen science is a really uh, trendy term right now, but there are a lot of opportunities there to truly and equitably um, include people um, and take their standpoint um, as researchers instead of just applying what we think would be best in those situations. And I would probably add um, that participation in the policy process um, is, uh, you know, overdue. You know, a lot of um, how energy is regulated uh, in the United States happens, again, behind closed doors. Um, and we need women and we need community members at those tables uh, to kind of set, um, you know, the agenda in some ways, uh, you know, when, rate, when rates are discussed and when they were approved, you know, kind of having a better understanding of what the impact would look like from the lived experience is important. Uh, and there have been some efforts uh, to, uh, you know, kind of bring um, folks that are kind of adversely impacted by um, higher energy prices to those processes. Um, so that's like what they call procedural justice. Another form of procedural justice um, is actually having people, um, women and people of color in particular, uh, be part of the boards of rural electric co-ops um, so that they are, you know, also in positions of leadership and dictating the policies um, in this more decentralized form of um, energy uh, provision. Uh, so I see, you know, the kind of possibilities more in the policy realm uh, for participation in part because um, you know, there's a way in which these discussions without the people that are affected um, end up, you know, kind of ignoring uh, what the impacts of those decisions actually feel like on the ground. And so um, that would be kind of the, my response to, to your thoughtful question. All right, um, we have another question that is for any of the pan panelists. Um, what does the future of energy justice look like with our current administration? I mean, I think that, I mean, it's clear that they're focusing on infrastructure, on clean energy, and even 
um, on issues of um, the social safety net. Um, and to me, those all kind of park into like these problems of, um, you know, the energy sources and, um, you know, thinking creatively about the creation of jobs um, and the transition from, um, you know, kind of economies that have traditionally, uh, you know, been involved in fossil fuels to like kind of give them uh, a leg up and the right kinds of support to transition to cleaner energy. I think it's front of mind. Um, and I'm really hopeful, you know, because a dear friend of mine, Shalanda Baker is now, um, the, she's an attorney by training. She was an academic uh, researcher up until her presidential appointment. Um, as the inaugural uh, director of energy justice at the Department of Energy. It's the first time ever that the Department of Energy has actually taken a position around this question of justice. And so um, to me, these things actually seem pretty synergistic in this current administration. Um, what that actually materializes into in terms of policy is yet to be seen, but I think inten their intention is certainly to kind of connect uh, some of these dots. I think that's a really um, important question. And I think it's also a question that we have to contextualize in terms of where energy policy decisions really get made in this country. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's exciting to look at what's happening at the federal level. We also know that, you know, what happens at the federal level, unless there is lasting um, legislation passed by Congress, if it's done in other ways, is likely to get overturned the next time we have a president who is less interested in clean energy and environmental issues. So one of the things that's really important to think about is how we can actually start at um, the local and state level in order to establish policies and regulations that um, can last no matter who the president is at the national level. Um, and so this goes back to what Dr. Hernandez was saying about, um, you know, the policy process, figuring out like, you know, where are these meetings, where these decisions are getting made, who is in that room, you know, is there equity in terms of who's appointed to be the, um, you know, the head of the Utilities Commission? In Ohio, the answer to that is no, not really. Um, and so I think one of the things to think about is, you know, yes, these federal level policies make a really big difference, but the majority of the movement we've seen, especially on climate policy, has been at the state and local level. Um, and so those are places where it's easier for young people to enter. Those are people where it's easier for people with no, you know, political experience to enter the conversation. And so one of the things I would really encourage people to do is think about, you know, pay attention to those federal conversations, but look at what's happening in your own cities, in your own counties and states. All right. Um, next, we have a question for Dr. Hernandez. Uh, what are some key policies in New York City or the U.S. that are working to address energy insecurity? Oh, uh, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry, of course I'm muted. Um, okay, so um, basically I was saying that uh, adjusting energy insecurity at the policy level is really about two, maybe three things. So one um, is about, you know, kind of addressing the cost of energy. Um, and that has primarily been done via um, bill assistance. So the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, which um, very sadly um, only actually covers about 16% of um, the people that are eligible um, at the federal level. And, and the majority of that assistance is, um, is actually around heating, is around heating. So there's like a whole like cooling assistance gap. Um, so despite the fact that many people in the South, for instance, are considered energy burdens, uh, they're not getting the um, financial support that they need uh, through um, home energy assistance program benefits. Um, so that's kind of one piece. And obviously another piece of that would be rate setting rates um, in such a way that uh, they accommodate um, ability to pay, which for the most part, 
you know, um, utilities are really happy about an, uh, an, an equal, like kind of set fee that everybody pays, but that's not kind of an equitable approach to dealing with these issues. Um, anyway, the second part is uh, around improving um, the physical conditions of housing. So that's due energy efficiency um, upgrades for the most part and weatherization. And then the third is about participation in the clean energy economy. Um, and that is about upgrading, you know, heating and, and things like that. In New York City, um, there they have successfully done um, really kind of maybe more in the realm of the second, which is to provide people access to um, air conditioning units. So, um, so LIHEAP um, is a kind of a block grant program. So every state has a different allocation. And uh, again, like there's this bias around heating. So in New York City, um, there's very little that is actually done in the way of providing uh, financial support for air conditioning, despite the fact that like temperatures are increasing and we're having hotter summers than ever as a result of climate change. But last year during COVID, um, there was this um, COVID heat wave plan and that issued 74,000 air conditioners uh, to um, households, uh, low income households, both living in public housing and living in other housing types. Um, and that to me was a very interesting opportunity to kind of distribute a, an energy based appliance, um, making it possible for people to actually cool safely at home and then stay home um, under kind of the stay at home orders um, that came with the pandemic. Um, and I think New York City is also trying uh, to kind of work in that third pillar, uh, which is uh, around um, kind of being more inclusive. Uh, in the clean energy transitions, um, but they haven't gone really far enough there. So, um, you know, this continues to be, you know, kind of a question about, you know, the electrification of buildings, for instance, and even improving. So like they've actually put, if any of you have been to New York City, um, you know, in, in the past, I don't know, five years, you would have seen in restaurants like a grade uh, that is in front of um, the, the restaurant. Um, and in California, they have the same thing. Um, and they started to do that in terms of energy performance in buildings. Um, but we know that many of the kind of building performance indicators are poorest in the poorest areas. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily change the transactional aspects of housing. So the whole idea is to make those things transparent so that when people are buying or they're renting, people know a little bit more about the energy profile of the building that they're living in. Um, but it just doesn't work that way when people are also housing insecure. So um, I think these are our attempts to get us to those places around reducing emissions. But um, you know, I guess my takeaway here is that they don't go far enough and they certainly aren't accommodating of the kind of economic burdens, certainly not also, um, you know, kind of enough in the way of making it really possible for people to participate, for instance, um, in a dignified um, home environment that has like access to adequate heating, cooling and other kind of energy needs, but also, um, is a kind of an eye toward clean energy. And because I had such a long uh, response to that question, then I'm going to like try and not speak um, to any of the other questions unless it's really essential because I'd like to really hear from um, my colleagues. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question for Dr. Golly Robertson. Um, how would you recommend young students get involved in initiatives to increase women in the energy industry? That's a great question. I mean, for University of Dayton students, um, you know, we have so many women um, in, especially in the engineering school, who are involved in clean energy. So um, UD is a great place to start with this. I would encourage um, several things. One, I think, is that you um, you know get involved in some sort of campus organization outside your major that is not um, related specifically to the field that you're going into, but it, uh, related to sustainability or climate change or energy justice. 
um, if that's something that exists. If that doesn't exist in a way that you're interested in it, um, the time to try out new things and create new organizations or initiatives really is college, like you're here to experiment. So that's another thing that you can think about is, you know, if there's some, if there's a gap that you see, this is a time when you can really, um, you know, try to fill in that gap or try to create a project that would address it in some ways. Um, the other thing I will say is that um, the opportunity to, you know, visit our uh, state capital in Ohio, um, it's only, you know, an hour away to get to Columbus. So there are lots of policy things that are happening in Columbus that you can go to um, and learn more about the actual energy um, decision making process. And I think, you know, even if you are not interested at all at getting into politics yourself, just attending a hearing or seeing how um, that, that process works can be really empowering because um, it allows you to understand one, how often convoluted and technical it is, um, but it also just gives you a sense of like what you are operating under when you're working on um, changing energy systems. And then I think the other thing is really talking with um, other students who are in the same boat with you. So um, networking like this, I mean, this conference, when we had it in person the first year, it was so exciting to see all of the students in the same place. And I think um, just continuing to connect with each other and support each other is probably the most important thing because, um, you know, if we are gonna be in settings where we may be the only women in the room at times, it's really, really important that we have a really good support system behind us um, and that we have people who can, um, you know, hold us up from the outside, even if on the inside, it feels like we're um, on our own at times. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question that is for anyone to answer. Um, what does the balance between ensuring energy access and ensuring energy is clean versus energy access to fossil fuels, which is sometimes cheaper and easier? I think that touches on uh, ongoing conversations around, um, you know, bringing people online with energy access and what we say is like the sustainable and like right way of doing it um, versus, but I think a lot of those conversations come from people who have access already and so are trying to then make decisions for other people's other, other countries. Um, and so I, I don't have a good answer to this. I, um, but I do, think that there's so much potential for renewables. I know the electrification rate has been increasing thanks to bringing, um, you know, renewables online in the form of mini grids, uh, things like that. But also um, if the compromise is delaying people getting access to crucial services, as Dr. Hernandez said, like access to energy is life, then that should be a priority. Um, so I'm not sure, maybe the other panelists have, have something else to add, but that's kind of my take. I think one of the challenges there too is it's easy to identify problems um, that are fixable. For example, people using cook fuel that is, you know, really, really bad for air quality and also, um, you know, has a high carbon impact. Like it's a thing that we can see. It's a thing that we can, from a scale perspective, change. Um, but when we look at, from a climate perspective, when we look at the, the actors who are having the largest impact on our climate, it is, it is big corporations. It is, um, you know, these big utilities. It is some of these um, actors who have massive amounts of power and therefore um, are able to continue to pollute. And so, um, you know, I think one of the answers to that question is about like bringing people online and getting energy for them um, and, you know, increasing energy justice at the same time that we are really 
forcing change in the places where it matters the most. Um, and that's not to say that clean energy shouldn't be implemented everywhere it should. Um, but I also think that it's easy to sort of misidentify the problem um, when it's easy to see those small fixes. Um, and so I would just argue like small fixes are great, but let's also look at really the, the biggest source of the problem. Thank you. Um, and then we have one more question in the Q&A feature and a couple in the chat. So I think we should be able to get to all of them. Um, are there any international renewable energy oriented programs that can be recommended to anyone interested um, or college students looking into it, especially ones that allow for direct community interaction? Erin, it sounded like that was a big part of your work, right? Yeah, so that's where I, I, I had a follow-up question to this. So in talking about programs, um, is that at a grad level? Um, and if it is, then I think identifying if there's literature out there that you really uh, identify with, you really enjoy, and looking up where those programs are. Um, it can be a beast to identify grad programs that are what you want. And so I think if you're going the research route, looking for those key papers is one place to start in narrowing down your list. In terms of uh, international programs more generally, I'm not as familiar. I know more US-based organizations that do work internationally and would be happy to connect uh, to share some of those resources. Um, although some of them aren't specific to renewable energy, but they do touch on energy components, so. Um, all right, then we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, this question is specifically for Dr. Hernandez. Um, it is, I am wondering what you see as the best practices for alleviating energy security access and what your dream action would be? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, you know, kind of a, a critical question. I'm just going to very simply say um, that the dream action would be that we figure out from a technology perspective how to have in-kind transfers of energy uh, to people that need it. So... You know, if you are hungry and food insecure, you can go to a food pantry and they give you food in kind. When it comes to energy, we don't have uh, kind of an equivalent way of distributing energy. And yet, um, I feel like the technology can be developed to do that. Um, and so my dream would be to do something that, you know, kind of links people with kilowatt hours, you know, like, um, and I, I feel like that's something that, you know, many of you might be able to actually uh, do at some point. And what we can do in the interim is, is to really set rates um, that reflect um, affordability. So there's this percent um, of income payment plan. Uh, which basically has a set point of like not paying more than three to six percent of household income uh, to energy bills. And to me, that's really an important start that we start to kind of just accommodate, uh, you know, people that, um, you know, have different abilities uh, to pay, um, the, you know, the, the electricity and natural gas and other fuels that they use. Um, at this point, we just assume that people can manage and, and I just see every day how people fall through the cracks. So I'd like to just see kind of greater accommodations uh, for people in need. And our final question for this evening, um, energy security slash justice in the US is generally impact, oh, oh wait. Okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Energy security and justice in the US generally impact people who consider themselves powerless. 
How can they assume the power to control their options? I think one of the big challenges here has to do with um, the high level of bureaucracy that exists, whether it is applying for low income energy assistance programs or whether it is actually being able to participate in the decision making process. I mean, all of these things are technical and there's so many levels of knowledge and so many barriers to people. Um, you know, being able to actually get in the door to make those decisions, even when it comes to, for example, um, you know, changing your energy provider in Ohio to use cleaner energy. These things are just not equally accessible to people, um, and they're not equally accessible along lines of race, class, and gender. Um, so I think one of the things that we can do is, one, like, make those processes more accessible and less convoluted. Um, and the other thing that we can do is actually work with people to help them learn to navigate those complex bureaucracies in certain ways. Um, because um, one of the biggest barriers to people participating in the policy process is that um, just like, just that difficulty of entering into that conversation. Um, so that would be my argument, both from you know, individual people, you know, taking that step, but also from a perspective of how organizations um, and institutions can assist people with that aspect of the process. Well, um, thank you again for everyone attending tonight's session. We are appreciative and glad that you were able to join us. We hope you enjoyed today's session and learned a little bit more about clean energy and social impact. As a reminder, we have one final session next week, Monday. It will be an open panel discussion where you will be able to ask more questions specific to early career development and steps after getting your bachelor's degree. We will have a graduate student and young professional panel for that evening. Thank you all again for attending the conference tonight. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone.